Hacker Ñol, Hackers en Español. Ready? Okay. So, um, hey guys, uh, how are you guys doing today? Hope good. Um, yeah. So this talk is going to be a little bit um, like an overview. It's going to start a, a bit of history, uh, the power of free, uh, free software and um, security, just to go more into like more deep into later into like uh, what is happening right now in the security field and why we need more free software hackers to actually come into it and help us with a couple of stuff that's going on, you'll see now. <laughs> oh, and free software um, in the security world in the enterprise level too. Yes, exactly, that's basically what um, So we should probably introduce ourselves. Uh, this is uh, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, I currently work at Backcrow in San Francisco. Um, here, sorry. All right, sorry. Here. Okay, so I currently work in Backcrow. I do infrastructure and security engineering. I'm originally from Spain, Alicante. Um, I've been a free software advocate since the 90s. Um, I think I'm one of the lower members for the Free Software Foundation. So yeah, I'm an anarchist. Uh, I, I don't tell myself about everything I do. I rarely go to school. And what I do is for compliance for my company because they need that stuff. So yeah, whatever. So I'm yeah. Just, we're just basically here for uh, technical and motion support. Because <laughs> around, if you guys have any questions, um, nice. feel free to raise your hand. I'll come here. So yeah, a little bit about me. So yeah, back in the days uh, when I really started getting interested in free software and like uh, hacking and all this stuff. Uh, so yeah, I was a little bit kid, you know. So I was in Spain. So it was really expensive to really call a modem because uh, we had no local calls. You know, you had to pay by the minutes. Now you guys, you guys were lucky. So you guys go be like all night in front of the phone, right? We couldn't do that, right? We have this company called Telefonica, and it charged you by the minute. It was a pain. So we were always trying to find ways how to avoid this. So uh, I was a kid, so I can say that now. It's been like 20 years. So yeah, there was not, we did a lot of things that are not really ethical to actually connect to CompuServe back in the day and be able to explore the internet and fight on it and the benefits of knowledge, so because that was the only way we can learn, really. And those times, if you think about it, there was no books about security. Right, right now, there's pen tested books, all kind of stuff. Back in the day, there was not that. You know, you do software engineering, you were a programmer, you went to school, you know, and you had to learn everything by yourself. Such it was okay, because that's the way most of us did. But you wanted more information. You wanted to talk to people in IRC that were like you, right? That's what you had to do, at least for us in Spain. So let's go in. So yeah, so how it all started. As you guys know, like most of you guys already know about this, but anyways, I'm just gonna go over it. And it all started here, you know, in the club, in the railroad club, Richard Stallman, all those people. They started everything that we are doing today. It was a new frontier, cyberpunk, explorers, and all tender cracks that started to roam. The Wild Wild West, or what we coined it, by, what was coined by William Dixon at the time as cyberspace. And the seeds of change. Richard Stallman started the GNU revolution around the same time. The Lot and the Legion of Doom and MOD, also known as Master Decision, were exploring the decentralizing frontier. And the reason I'm putting this together, because these two communities kind of like have uh, been always like each other's neck a little bit, but uh, I actually want to like uh, put it actually was kind of almost the same people always. But movements making our power structures nervous in different ways. One of them was attacking free, like a proprietary software. Uh, the other people were talking to surveillance. So basically, like we were always in the same point, in the same path. And of course, Stephen Levy, you know, he's kind of like a wrote this uh, kind of our manual. You know, it's like a, he documented like a, the tradition of really what is hack, the hacker culture, the hacker spirit, and we still use it like nowadays. I think like. A, you are a software engineer, you don't read this book, you probably don't really know what it's hacking about, right? So yeah, so he set it out in a stone, like uh, that's one of his like, uh, quotes in it. Um, it's one of the quotes that I like most, that I always remember since I was a kid, and I always have it in me, and I still every day, every decision that I make, I always think in that quote. And do I follow with that quote? Do I follow those ethics? Or do I'm letting myself go? And of course, like real life, 
right? We had to have jobs and everything. So you cannot follow 100%, right? But when you go home, you do try to do so as much as you can. And it'd be like, you're at work, you're not meeting, and it's a pro business, you know, it's a corporate, like, a world. So, like, a, you know, they make money. So you have to, like, a, put your influence as much as you can, right? Okay, so some of the influential movies that come out of that book, basically, those ideas. Hacktivists, cypherpunks, crypto anarchists, of course, the hacker culture, cyberpunk, the free software movement. You know, all these cultures come kind of from the same roots. They just split later. Okay, so that looks awesome, right? Since we're on the right path, that's, I'm talking about the late 80s here, in the 90s. Well, this, this happened, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was, in my opinion, right, I, a lot of kids, they love these movies. I used to hate it. I was, at that time I was like 18, 19, I was really into hacking at that point. I was into free software. I was like, you know, it's cool, but, you know, it's like too many teenagers running around and, you know, rollerblades. I don't think that's exactly what we do at nights in IRC, right? I don't think it has nothing to do. I mean, it was a cool movie, but that's about it. And actually, the movie itself, it wasn't the problem. To be honest, it was the media. The media portray, you know, people pranking, portray people who actually were just exploring. They put like criminals. And a lot of people pay the price. People that nowadays, they would be like, a, probably like, a, they're making a lot of money just getting advice to those companies, right? But in those times, just like free software, nobody understood. Nobody understood what was security. Nobody understood what was free software. You know, people were demonizing us. So do you think um, at this point is kind of where uh, the hacker ethos just kind of got muddied with that whole uh, political and... Yeah, actually, and that's when the free software kind of like a movement, we kind of like said, no, no, those are crackers, right? Right. You know, because uh, we kind of got to the point that the media was so affecting our same movement, even though in the free software community, we were running the same tools that people were using to like explore, right? Like MMAP and such. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was just a bad thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and then of course on the free software camp, we got this. Most of you guys that have been around for a long time, from the bomber, and like people said, the free software is communism, you know, the Halloween papers, you know, the whole nine yards. They would try to like desmoralize us, break our, you know, all our communities, but it didn't happen. Good thing. As there in the both camps, they were in the both communities, the software hackers and the computer hackers, and you know, this is what we're gonna talk about today, right? Because there's real hackers on both sides, right? Now our computer security hackers are like kids with rollerblades writing scripts and bringing it to computers. And not, you know, not all the software people, you know, it's, it's people just writing like malware, right? Okay, both of the community, we're probably at the same community, as I mentioned already. The tools people use for security for the last 20, 25 years were provided by software hackers for computer hacking and security. And like I mentioned, ToneLock, NetCat, MMAP, Xpeen, and thousands of other tools. I can't name them all. So this is probably where I should slow you down a little bit. You see, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about you know, these tools, why they exist in the enterprise now, and why they're important as opposed to going through the Oh, that's actually industry. a good question. Well, these tools were brought by passion, mm -hmm. right? People who really care about this stuff, they were exploring, you know, they really wanted to make a change. This is what happened in the corporate world, you know, most in 2007, 2010, when security was becoming a multi-billion dollar, like a, business, you know, there was a lot of people, they needed people. They had not enough people that knew about it, right? Right, so there was a big knowledge gap and there was also a problem. Yeah, and then they, got, they, they had no other tools. They had to go to the free software tools, right? Even they didn't like it. They have to use them. And we we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so software, of course, respected the hacker ethics and was released as free software in most cases or the compatible licenses. So here we are, hand by hand, free software and computer security. Again, the modern computer security field needs hackers to write software that is open, free and respect the hacker ethics while at the same time breaking and going beyond what we can expect, as it's usually done in the true hacker spirit. Now let's forward to 2010. Computer security is getting to be a big business. Hackers are in demand. New test fields are created over traditional ones. Secure engineer, pen testers, blue teams, red teams, the whole nine yards. Pen test is to computer hacking what opens us to free software. It's stripping the politics and idealism out of them to create a simple pro business market easier to digest. Basically the same thing. So yes, here we are. Now we have a lot of academics, non hackers doing pen testing on security. In the last five years, security is a multi billion dollar market. A lot of software companies are trying to get a piece of the pie. This is okay. But what about the hacker ethics, right? 
What about the freedom of the open decentralized ideas of the hacker revolution that Stephen Levy put in his book? This talk is not intended to agree or disagree or discredit any professionals, obviously, but to be able to talk about why free software is needed in the penetration testing world nowadays. We have to know the link between the past and the present. So from now on, I would describe hacking as penetration testing, just to be, you know, just like people call open source, you know, same thing. No. I don't, but yeah, you know what I mean. So pen testing and free software are another thing that they have in common. It took a lot of time for people to understand and fully respect the whole point that open and libre are not a threat, but what actually revolutionized the internet area, and so it did. The same with security hackers. It took 20 years to people to understand the difference between people exploring and pranking, the different people, the people, the, uh, blah, 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 sorry, <laughs> the difference between curiosity and real criminal behavior. Today we are hired and not demonized it. Others were not so lucky because they were made an example that they didn't understand. Okay, so another example of free software tools, popular software that hackers have brightened in along the years that are used by security professionals. Some of them are MAP, open, there's thousands. I just named it there a couple, some of the times that, the ones that I use. So what's the problem, right? Most tools are still free software, people ask. That's true, but like we say before, as the hacker ethics leave the field, also does free software. A lot of new professionals already abandon free software you know, and free software options, sorry about that. <laughs> they use tools like Burp, that's closest source, even though it's free to download, it's gratis, but it's not Libre, right? So, yeah, go ahead. I just want to kind of mention here, um, every book that I've ever read uh, recently on um, hacking or application, um, security pen testing, has always referenced Burp. Yes, so that's and that's like, a problem. It's like an over, yeah. um, over prevailing theme. So I think that's something that, you know, we're seeing a lot more of, and the proprietary tools are kind of creeping their way into mm -hmm. the internet. That's exactly what's going on. And of course, the more academic gets, because uh, the people, the companies that have the power to do any change, they go into academia, just like Microsoft did in the late 90s, and they were given free licenses. Now the people get into like security, they actually learn it with the proprietary tools. So they get out, they don't want to use MMAP anymore. They don't want to use NCAT. They use this other proprietary tool, that's how they learn. Okay. It's a question really like what you get used to because you know you become kind of like um, accustomed to an environment. So like I have my IDE that I love. Mm -hmm. And if you learn, you know, how to do pen testing with Perp and that's what you become used to, how is it that you can actually get people to pull away from that and you can Hacker ethics. Exactly. So that's why you have to go back to the history to people know exactly where the movement comes from and what it was standard about. Yeah. Right? If you really care about it, then you will actually move to free software. So, yep. <laughs> Sometimes it's really not their fault, to be honest. That's actually what you were asking. So, preparatory tools like Burp actually have come a long way with no free software competition. Okay, they were new tools for like new demand and stuff. But then, good thing that OWAS, they like actually, they really good at uh, creating uh, open source and free software tools for web application security. Mm -hmm. So, they step it in and they started to like uh, develop a SAP proxy, right? That's actually kind of the competition, the Burp. It's a proxy, you know that a lot of people use, uh, but still not there though. In the last six months, it's really have grown a lot. I use it, but I don't, I don't care taking like two months more of uh, the driving curve to really learn it, right? Because I believe in this. I mean, honestly, but other I people won't do that. I was out myself and then tried Burp later. And <laughs> found Burp, you know, it's kind of a converse of what we just said. It's what you learn first and it's what you actually adopt. So when I learned Mm -hmm. That first, you know, I got kind of used to that environment, and then when it got better, I was like, oh, this is great, and then I tried Burp later, and I was like, wait a minute, I don't understand where anything is on this. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yep. But usually the other way around, because some people go to academics, they learn with Burp, and then you come, hey, you should use that proxy. That's too complicated. It's like five minutes, and they just drop it, yep. you know. So, yeah, so we're, okay, yeah. So that's basically what it is. So, so yeah, okay, so let me give you an overview. Oh, well, anyways, before I get into that, so yeah, we need to get more people, more developers, actually to like help our organization like uh, oh, OSWAP, to actually come in and uh, help us actually make open and free available tools that actually security professionals can actually use, right? So they don't have the skills to say, well, you know, just burp does a better job. Oh, I'm used to burp. Right? I mean, that's the same problem like the free software community has been having with other tools all along, not just 
the computer security world. So it's, it's basically the same thing, but I feel like sometimes we are abandoning the security field when it's actually booming now, right? So there's a lot of people coming in the field. So right now, if we don't stop that, they're really going to take over the whole thing. So in five years, it's just going to be like proprietary tools. Well, there's a market and, again, a profit. Exactly. So that's why we had to like put an eye on that as free software activists. So yeah, I was like, so uh, this is more about mostly like uh, myself, but yeah. Okay, let me now give you an overview of the tools I usually use when I engage in a pen test. Uh, most of my, I always try to use free software as much as possible. Uh, the only, well, I'll get to that in a bit. So anyway, last, I do a lot of customization tools, mostly in Ruby, Python. I try not to use tools that somebody else brought. To be honest, sometimes they don't work 100% right, right? You know, they make your life easier, but sometimes you need to like modify something. And it's just like, it's just not gonna handle it. And it's just gonna make so much noise. But if I were to use tools, you know, this is the tools I would probably use. use like uh, my district, I don't use Kali, uh, just a personal choice. Uh, I use Black Arts, because I like Arts and Linux a lot more. Uh, of course, MAP, NCADS, Bean, the Backdoor Factory, Bell Framework, Soft Proxy, Nico, you know, ton of stuff, for, like different situations. Uh, manual testing, mostly with uh, web app, SQI, XSS. That's all manual. I try not to use SQL map as much. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good because I'm kind of deaf. <laughs> Uh, which one? No, I haven't. Like, uh, that's an operating system too. No, I use uh, back. Uh, I use like. Um, I'm really not into sec to be honest. I'm really not into security operating systems. Uh, I try Black Arts. Uh, I know some of the guys who develop it, so I install it, and I was okay, cool. I was using Arts already. So basically, Black Arts is Arts with the security tools. So I throwing like Pac-Man them down. So they already comes with it. So by now, like a big, if I were like, is, if I had a class of computer security right now, or penetration testing, the last thing I will tell the people taking the class to put like a Kali on it. Because yeah, they're not really learning Linux that way, right? If I really gonna teach somebody how to do security, I would really teach them how, how to install Linux, Linux from scratch. That's what I would teach them. Learn how to compile your kernel. Go and compile the modules to the kernel, right? You can exploit a system if you don't even know how it works. You only, you know, you're just gonna go exploit DB and like just get deployed and that's it, right? Such as okay, it makes your life, but you do need to know the basis, right? So I will start by not saying no Kali for you. Of course, people will think I'm a nasty, but yeah, that's another story. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, unfortunately, as a security professional, you do have to like run somewhere this operating system that I run the internet, right? So I don't run it as my main operating system, but I do use VirtualBox, and I, I try to get away from VMware because it's proprietary. VirtualBox is not fully open either, but you know, I have some of them in KVM, that's a little bit better. I just came, you know, I just use VirtualBox for now. Uh, so yeah, I had to run this viruses software, and I treat it as malware, basically. Those are systems that I need to exploit, and I need to break apart. So for me, just like malware. And of course, if I had to like compile like a Win32 exploit or application, I had to like develop uh, some shellcode for it, I have to like go into it and do it. I have no other choice. So anyway, my methodology, my, this, I'm not gonna put my secrets here obviously, but uh, I do gonna put like basically like a, basically my basic method, methodology? Methodology. Method, thank you. <laughs> they always laugh about me when I say that. <laughs> so anyway, so of course I do my information gathering. I use the internet most of it. It's usually the, the easiest. Uh, Recon NG, Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, NSLOOKUP, Dick. You know, normal tools, you do the enumeration, the scanning, you do the light post of the server or your targets, you get the ports, you find out what versions are running the ports, pretty standard. Uh, don't trust the version because most of the times, uh, Google System Administrator will actually change the versions or take them off, so you wanna check the fingerprints. You know, MAP is kinda, okay for that sometimes. So yeah, uh, then of course if you can, if you're able to do the sniff and man in the middle attacks, like if you're, like in a, you're attacking a web, 
application, like a wireless application, and you're actually able to get into a company that way, of course, that's going to be the easiest. And of course, then you're going to have like exploitation, right? Let's say like uh, you got this uh, server that's one of your targets, like it's left behind somewhere. And they have, um, you know, Samba protocol running. So you do like M for Linux, like uh, you check what I have. Okay, you find, okay, wait, this is portable. It's actually a well known exploit, didn't patch it. Ah. So you download it, you compile it, you run it. Okay, you have shell, right? You get shell, you're still like a normal user. You may be like a Apache user, you know, whatever, HTTP user. So then you have to do like a, your privilege escalation. And you do a privilege escalation, basically you do the same thing. You're always gonna look for like low-hanging fruits, right? You don't wanna compli complicate your life because you're doing pen testing, right? So basically there's like a, it's not like an APT attack that you can take like three months to do, right? You're home, you have three months to do it, and eventually you go into the server. This is different because this is more like a business kind of side. It's a pen test. You don't want to take more than five days to do this. So you're always going to look for the low-hanging fruit. So if there's a real exploit, wrote it for that, you download it, you read what it does. You don't want to run a exploit as it is because you may be exploiting yourself. So you have to get the shell code. You know, make sure that's actually opening, you know, the port that's supposed to open and run whatever. So then you run it, you go in, your root, buy. Your system, buy, right? So you catalog it, and then you go to the next one, right? You go there and you do the pivoting, you already got the network, and you go to another server, and you get as much as you can, because the whole point of the pen test is not to own the systems. It's actually to get the company an overview of what they need to fix. Some people f forget that. Oh, I just own the system, right? It's not about that, right? So you, your target is credit cards. So databases is a big target. Um, to be honest, to own the system is not that important because what you really want is to go in and like get as much information of the company assets, right? That is really what they pay you for. So yeah, and this is just an overview or that, um, yeah, like, uh, I just want to thank, like, uh, people on my team, these Pagatos people. Uh, I wanted to do, like, a little, of, um, you know, like, I wanted to show how to use SAP a little bit, but I don't have it in this computer. Uh, I come from San Francisco, and the other one's a workstation computer. It was huge, you know. Maybe next time, instead of doing, like, a talk, I could do a workshop, and then I can actually do some cool stuff with that. Right? So this was just an hour. Basically, it's a call to like you guys, right? People in the free software movement to step into the security field. Don't leave it in the side because these people are really coming in. They come with the products, you know, the cool scanners and stuff. And like people just have to press buttons and look at this. Oh, this website is vulnerable by this and this and that. Here, give me the money. And that's, they're not really hackers, right? Anyways. Actually, I have a question. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, what are the advantages that you see in having all open source stack for doing pen testing and security versus something closed sourced and paid, and how does that help you do your job? Well, the advantage is open. Uh, it's collaborative. It has it respect the hacker ethics. Uh, I can look at the code. I can modify it. If I need a module that's not there, I can write it myself. I don't need to wait for somebody upstream to do it, right? I can be more specific with a commercial tool or like a closed source tool, it's gonna make so much noise, right? Because you're not pinpointing exactly what you want. I can go to like a, a open tool, like a, let's say like a Python, right, tool, that's actually doing something. And I can say, that, well, this actually company, they modify this, so I can modify the script <coughs> to actually be more specific to what I'm attacking, right? With closed source, I cannot do that. So you're kind of comparing a shotgun to a laser, basically. I guess, yeah, I don't know that analogy. <laughs> My first language is Spanish, so I get lost at times. <laughs> so yeah, any questions about this? Mm -hmm. Cool. So hi. Um, hi, I'm new to the tech world. Mm -hmm. I just learned how to code eight weeks ago. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice for someone like myself who is getting her, starting to get her feet wet mm -hmm. and is also not really um, it's hard to get into tech if you 
there's not a lot of people that look like you. I mean, and I think yeah. you can sort oh, of relate. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Like, um, I think it's all about passion. Like, uh, you actually, you guys have it easy, right? Now you can go to a bookstore and like, uh, so how to call and see, how to use the GDB debugger, right? So <laughs> when we were starting, like, uh, we didn't have. It was like most, you were lucky you were not BBS that have like a lot of documents. You were like, oh my God, this is the holy grail, right? So you kind of like uh, had to work it out by experience and trial and error. Now you can do the same thing. It's still having books, they're not gonna show you everything, right? So you have to go beyond the book, right? The book will just get you your feet wet, right? Oh, I actually like this. So then you have, that, you have to do that yourself. Go beyond the book. So you get into tech. So let's say like uh, you like software, right? So okay. So what I was like say like learn now that you're learning, learn how to write secure software because it's gonna be easier to learn it now than later, right? Things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. In my opinion. <laughs> In my opinion. <laughs> as far as um, like books and programs to start with to get into these tech sessions, um, do you know about any kind of distributors? Would you recommend that? Uh, or I'm sorry, not the kind of distributors, but I'm thinking of a different thing. I forgot the name. Is it Bio and Python? Uh, the, guy, the guy who's actually made The auto exploitation? I think like any book will be good. It depends on the person. Everybody learns in a different way. I recommend to people that are exploitation because it doesn't show you tricks. It shows you actually how to like uh, run a buffer overflow and how it works, right? So I would say like uh, learn assembly, go low level as much as you can, and go up from there, right? That's usually my opinion because you can go to a book that says, okay, pen testing in 20 days, right? Get burp and run the scan, and you got the system. And that could be possible, true. But then you're just going to be like anybody else professional that's coming to the field. You really want to know what the hell those tools are doing in the background. I will say, you cannot just get some shell code online and just run it. You have to know how to create your own shell code. Or at least when you download something, you have to know how to read it, right? So start from the low level. Even though it's, you may think it's not really, it is related. C, very much related still. Assembly, very much related. More if you want to write your own exploits and not use somebody else's. Or you want to modify somebody's exploit that used to work for Windows 98, but it may still work for Windows 2000, but not as the exploit is. You just have to modify it a little bit. Right? Things like that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you you said you had some virtual box uh, mm -hmm. VMs that you like. Basically, do you open source your own sort of toolbox? So do you uh, you know have a spot where you have your VM set up uh, or at least uh, the no, it's usually I ISO files so that people can you know get that maybe even the exploited. Uh, 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 I don't quite understand. I have like a lab, okay. right? Uh, so basically like uh, in my lab, I have from Windows 95 all the way to like uh, 2008, right? In 2010 now, but, and I have all the presses. I have BSD, I got, um, I got Android. So that's when I wanna test something on them, I just turn it on, right? Log into it or like do my testing, whatever I need to spoil, whatever I need to test. You know, like uh, there's an update, some vulnerability, um, but they don't tell you exactly what vulnerability. Since I know the patch, I can go and actually find out what was the vulnerability. Because that will help me later when I actually do a pen test, actually use that for my pen test. So that kind of answer your question a little bit. Because uh, you cannot really open source like a proprietary software. I can open source basically like a, the idea how to make the lab, basically. Right. So you know what I mean? I guess I mean, I think uh, particularly for people that are, you know, like um, 
trying to penetration test something that I don't actually have is uh, something that is a little harder to learn, I feel like. So like, uh, you know, getting, setting up the lab that where you would uh, get all of the, you know, virtual box VMs and then mm -hmm. you would run your exploits on them and mm -hmm. uh, having all of that sort of experience seems like uh, it's not easy to come by. Even if, you know, when you get a book that has exploits and all that stuff, that's sort of one side of it, mm -hmm. but setting up the infrastructure is also part of it. Well, that's exactly, um, if I understand where you're going, I think like any, any good penetration tester needs to not just know how to do security, right? I've been a network engineer, you know, I've been a sysadmin, I've been a software engineer. So all that knowledge is gonna come to the point when you do all this stuff, right, security. Because you really need to know everything. And it's kind of like what I was saying to him. You cannot just go to school and say, okay, I'm gonna just learn penetration testing. Even though that's why they market to you, that's not really 100% true. You may be able to run the tools to do penetration testing, but you're not gonna be able to do, like you say, your own home network to create your own lab, right? You need to know how to like, I go into a Cisco switch, replicate it, you know, model all the stuff, Windows, you know, go into the registry, modify the registry. You really need to know everything from different network, systems, software. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, no problem. So I can but, give you the slides. Uh, I just wanted to know what your advice is for uh, doing uh, bug hunts, uh, bug bounties. Mm -hmm. um, would you recommend you know, trying to work with a company as opposed to like, kind of doing a freelance if they have some certs under you? Uh, that's a difficult question because I work for a bug, <laughs> for bug crowd. So um, I, think like a, um, I think what bug crowd is doing, and I don't want to like... Uh, you know, like pre marketing advertising or anything like that. I think they do a great job because uh, we actually do work with the InfoSec department, so like uh, different uh, companies. And it's not that they don't know security because they know it really well. But, you know, it's just like five people, six people, you cannot know. So the whole point of the, uh, the bad bounties, right? We work with a bunch of white hats. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like two people testing your network or the people internally testing the network that they still do, then you have 5,000 other people testing your network, right? So it's better they find it than if the bad guy finds it. Mm -hmm. Because eventually there's something, they will find it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So did that answer your question kind of? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's, it's all connected. Yeah, thank you, yeah. <coughs> Brian, mm -hmm. uh, I got the, the reverse question. Okay. Uh, as a, do you have any tips for sysadmins What's a common thing that you see that easily could be patched and fixed? Uh, misconfiguration, misconfigurations, that's a big thing, more than you think. And a big problem, it is not the sysadmin fault, because I've been there, it's more the whole hierarchy inside the company, and the bigger the worse. Uh, things come out, and if it's not in TV, it takes a month or two months to patch, right? Because you need to like go out the chains, and it takes some time. And in that time, you're gonna get screwed really bad, right? So it's not this is Simon Fall, and I know that well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you just confirm your GPG fingerprint? You have your keybase.io. Yeah, right here. Where is what? I don't have my keybase with me, unfortunately. Like, uh, I have like a UV key and I have my keys there. Okay. Not in this computer, it's not my computer. All right. So if you want to later, like oh, tomorrow, I'll bring it and we can go. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem, man. Hi. Hi. Thank you for this. I really just want to call and, and appreciate you how to reach me. I'm willing to help people get started, especially if you're an anarchist or free software yes. activist. That's awesome. Thank and you. on that note, can I just say, um, I've noticed that the hacker ethos and the ethics around security has sort of been um, militarized and... Yes, blue teams. Right yeah, there. and it's kind of turned into a way, it's like it's not, it's not so, like, it has become a military 
uh -huh. rather than like an exploration and a, and a yes. free car. And so it's nice to see that there's like a political bent to helping mm -hmm. people along those lines. Yes. And if I may, there's a group in New York City called Anarcho Tech NYC that's doing like I weekly, think I heard about them. Weekly yeah. Mr. Robot, Netflix and Hack, CTF teams, specifically for beginners. Um, I heard about the Mr. Robot. Netflix and Hack stuff? Yeah, yeah. Neat. <laughs> so um, I just want to like put a shout out and a plug to like go to github.com slash anarchotechnyc, mm -hmm. which is a repository that has write-ups of CTFs and, 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 and exercises written for people who have like never done security stuff. Mm -hmm. With That's the assertion really that it shouldn't be hard to explain. It was just kind of explained badly or not really with a lot of detail. So check that out. Thank you for this. Cool. I would love to chat with you somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, I will be a sign of it. Um, actually, he brings a really good question, though. That's actually one of the, like, uh, and this goes uh, for you that you were starting to, uh, sorry, I, I don't remember your name. But, yeah, anyways. <laughs> so, you know, CTFS, you know, challenges online, I think that's the best way to learn. Uh, let you like uh, get your hands dirty without having to do anything illegal. Uh, sometimes you have a home lab and it can get limited, right? Because uh, the home lab is easy, right? Because you just, you're home, you're doing your stuff, but you're in a competition. Actually, my team is Pagatos now, it's in a competition that's going on. And like, uh, and it's, it's fun, it's a great way to learn, and you don't know all the time everything. Doesn't matter how many years you've been doing it. And that's a good way to find out where you lack sometimes because you compete with other teams and you say, oh, crap, jeez. So, you know, and you can go. So I would recommend, I cannot recommend this. So if any of you, like I say, like I'm willing to help, that's actually how I started this whole East Bagatos thing. Um, we bring aboard like people that's learning how to code. And we have people that are, people who are teachers and do, like, they teach security in colleges. So we have all levels, right? And we get people in our CTF that doesn't know too much. Like we have three people that know and two people who started. So they can get their hands dirty, right? So you're welcome to send me an email. If you want to participate with our you know, group, you're welcome to. So yeah, I think it's time for 20, right? For 25 then. So any more questions? Okay. Thanks. This one's dedicated to all the hackers. No veo uno. Así. Claro. Ah, mierda, pero este se cae. Es muy demasiado grande. Es más grande. Con la de San Arquista. Con la de San Arquista. Mira, que esto se me cae. Mira, ¿cómo se pone esto? <risa>